Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. Inside the Set is a series that focuses on the design and decor of stories that excite us and ignite our imaginations, where we get to discuss the collaborations between production designers and set decorators and hear firsthand accounts of how those works of art came to be from their inception to ideas on the page through completion, where we sit in the dark and experience them collectively. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Leslie Rollins, SDSA. I'm here on behalf of the uh, Inside the Set with Set Decor. And I'm joining Kathy Marshall, SDSA, and Judy Ree, production designer. Uh, they did a TV series called Poker Face, which I have to say is pretty darn fun, uh, starring Natasha Leone. So welcome, both of you. Thanks for having us. <laughs> uh, before we get into details about Poker Face, I'd like to find out, first of all, uh, who are you? <laughs> Where did you come from? How did you get into the business? How did you meet? Uh, and, and what brought you to uh, Poker Face at this point in your lives? Judy, why don't you start? Sure. Um, my name's Judy Ree. I'm um, originally from L.A. I moved to New York to go to college, to NYU undergrad. Um, that's where I discovered production design and what the art department was about. Um, not that they taught us that, but it's something that I found on my own because in the film program, it was a little different than being in the theater program, which is totally different. Um, so I started working right out of college as an art PA, doing non-union work. Um, pretty much done every position. And um, I did a couple jobs as a set decorator and realized how difficult that job was. So then I started art directing and that's how I came to production design. Um, and in terms of when I met Kathy, I've heard her name for years. I've called her a few times. We try to work together, uh, but this time she was available and she did, did a little coaxing. And I'm so happy she joined us. Um, but as you know, she was one of two decorators who, you know, had to make this crazy schedule at work. So here we mm. are. All right. Um, Kathy, uh, who are you? <laughs> well, um, I came to the business kind of a different route. Um, I moved to New York when I was pretty young. I started in public relations, went back to Atlanta to go to art school. I got a full scholarship and decided to take a break and do that. While I was there, I started working with people in the PR business that I'd been working with who were starting to do commercials and production. And uh, they hired me as a PA there. So I would help find the locations and then make one location work for four different retail commercials by turning the camera in different directions. So I was involved in that and loved that part of it. When I then graduated early, moved back to New York and started a production company with my husband, Peter, who's a director. And we did commercials for a long time, years. And it gave me the opportunity at some point to step back from running the company and being the producer, executive producer to doing what I love, which is doing sets. And I started working as a prop master, got in 52 as a prop master. And that kind of evolved into eventually realizing, wait a minute, there's a category for set decorator as opposed to onset, offset prop person, you know, somebody who was a shopper or somebody who uh, worked on just propping. So that kind of segued me into doing set decorating, which I loved creating the environments and uh, kind of took off from there, started doing a couple of movies and then episodic and Judy and I have talked over the years trying to work together and finally poker face seemed to be the right one. You know, Natasha Leon is um, a multi-hyphenate powerhouse writer, director, actor, producer. She does it all. What is your experience like Judy with working with someone who is involved in every aspect of the production? Well, when I first met Natasha, she was in front of the camera. And then it wasn't until episode eight when she was directing that I got to work with her more closely and realized just how multifaceted she is as a director, a writer, an actress, and a producer. So she was involved in every 
a part of our decision making. We location scouted together. We discussed ideas together. So even though she has very clear ideas, she's very open to collaborating and is opens a dialogue and takes suggestions. And she's someone who likes to know what her options are, which of course I love as well. So I loved working with her. She was very uh, verbal, very clear, uh, could make decisions very quickly and uh, was able to visualize, you know, all the things that we love in a director. Yeah, absolutely. Kathy, what was your experience like working with Natasha? Well, I found her, as Judy said, um, pretty receptive uh, to some of the suggestions that were made. And there was a lot of fun collaboration, I think, on episode eight with the creatures and the you know, some of those choices of how to make the characters work with cr these creatives who, who deal with creatures and, and animated uh, stop motion uh, type animation. And it was fun seeing her approach to the creative process in terms of directing the talent and then also being the talent in, on camera. So I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was, was quite wonderful. The episode you mentioned is one of the most astonishing things I've ever seen, actually, in a TV episode, <laughs> simply because of the, the great depth of detail of the, of the creatures and so on. Um, in the series, the audience knows the crime. They know what's happened, the murder, whatever it is. And then we have the uh, pleasure of watching Charlie solve it. Basically, it brought to mind the old Columbo series, actually. Yeah. <laughs> How was your work affected by this idea that if you're basically telling the story backwards, right? You're starting with the crime, meeting the victim and the perpetrator, and then it evolves into, in general terms, and then it evolves into her solving it. Did you, or, or Judy might answer this as well, did you have like Easter eggs or um, clues on the sets for the audience? The Easter egg aspect didn't really come into play so much other than, you know, when Kathy and I would discuss kind of the backstory, there was very little backstory because, you know, we're in a new episode. We have new characters every 10 days, every episode. So um, I think we tried to embellish as much as we could for a little bit of backstory and personality. But in terms of, doing the crime backwards, it was one of the most specifically written series or scripts that I have ever worked on where the doorknob had to be just four inches from where they were going to turn because the camera was going to then reverse to see her to reveal the person behind them. So all those kinds of things came into play in terms of designing the set, where the, the layout was going to be, where the window was going to be placed. So it was the most specific. And I think in a way it's it's good because it is a different way to solve the puzzle as we always do. Um, I know Kathy had a very different take on it because, <laughs> as well as props, because it was so specific. And, you know, although Ryan was very open to once again, having it be a very give and take and a discussion about ideas. It wasn't so dogmatic, but there were story points that had to had to hit. And that was sort of camera driven of where we were going to shoot Charlie come in, where we were going to see Taffy come out and all those little, you know, the trap door, all those bits mm -hmm. and pieces had to get negotiated. Yeah. Kathy, how involved in you were that process? Well, when you read the script and you and you appreciate Ryan Johnson's uh, approach to, say, Knives Out and Glass Onion and how he creates these murder mysteries with all these like clues and things, uh, we did try to be very true to what the writers had written and provide as much visually as we could. I'm trying to think of specific elements or any Easter eggs that, that I put in. I know there were some. Uh, but I'm blanking. And uh, uh, but just all the things that we had to create behind the scenes, like uh, the creatures and the trap door and the in the theater set, you know, all the elements that have to work um, that further the crime or further, like especially the theater, I, I would think, Judy, where uh, they're backstage, they're up in the catwalk, they have to talk about uh, they're talking in a microphone to each other, but it's planned part, you know, it's like their cover or alien, whatever the alias. And there's all these 
uh, visual elements that we put into the sets, uh, into the stage set with the refrigerator with the back open and things that she has to play off of uh, the characters. So it was a fun challenge. And I think we, you know, kind of enjoyed that process. We'd say, what about this? And I'd show things to Judy and she'd say yes. And and uh, uh, it, it was a lot of fun to do this type of show. Let's talk about that dinner theater set for a minute. Episode uh, 106. Have you all done dinner theater? I have not done dinner theater, but I've been an audience member and um, enjoyed regional and dinner theaters. So I had a reference of what Ryan was going for. Now, in terms of the technical aspect of what happens behind the scenes and all those moments of how it's different from film, I was lucky enough to have a couple of set designers who have worked in theater, uh, Chris Roten and Antia Ellerman. They were able to kind of instill the details of, oh, the lights would never be there. The prop table would usually be here. All those moments were very um, authentically created. So that was really helpful. But this was definitely one of the more challenging and fun ones. But all the details, once again, as Kathy mentioned, were so specific of where the light had to fall, where the feather was going to get stuck, how she climbs up the catwalk. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, we had, I think, maybe two weeks. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, I loved the whole backstage vibe and the whole backstage area. I thought it was very, I've done a lot. I did theater originally when I was younger. And the whole thing brought back memories. Kathy, how did you approach all of that? I mean, look at this stuff, hampers and wardrobe racks and, you know, stored equipment, bulletin boards, all of that. Well, uh, I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun. And it was interesting because, I specifically didn't have a lot of theater experience, but I had a lot of uh, stage or set experience, being on set as a producer, ordering the equipment, knowing what lights work um, in a theater and, and being able to get specific about some of that stuff. I also had a, my um, assistant decorator, Megan Miller McKeever, had a, a great deal of theater experience. So she was a great asset to help with some of the rigging and ropes. Actually, I had done a theater, a backstage theater thing on another show, Mozart in the Jungle, uh, where we had created the symphony and a lot of backstage stuff. So I had a little bit of experience, but Megan was very good, too, at helping with, with the catwalk and some of the, the rigging and the ropes and things that we were able to source and, and bring in to make all that work. Was this a theater that you shot in or was this built? Well, that was what was really interesting about this. We were shooting in everything in Newburgh, New York, which is upstate New York. And we had to make all of our sets on all the episodes look like parts of the rest of the country, like Las Vegas and Texas and and wherever. And um, we were we didn't have we did have a stage that we built some of the key sets in. But the one big one was um, Anthony's Pier One, which was a. It was kind of a defunct event space, one of those big event palaces that had multiple rooms and kitchens and things that were just really old and kind of funky. And early on that, I guess Judy had built, um, they had built a casino in, in part of, in the main part, the ballroom of this space. And there was a tiny little stage, but it wasn't big enough or deep enough or tall enough. So we had to um, build that out and build a real stage and do the rigging and hang the lights um, and even figure out the carpeting because we had already established this really cool multicolored bizarre carpeting, but it was in a, in a Las Vegas um, uh, casino scene. So rather than spend $65,000 to lay new carpet, which we didn't have time to do, I suggested to our scenics that we all of it was going to get destroyed anyway and pulled up later. So we spray painted the carpet <laughs> that had been used in a previous episode. I spray painted it burgundy so that it would, you know, look different. And it kind of worked. <laughs> oh, it did. That's great. Yeah. So we built out the theater and then built a little, uh, you know, an acting set on the stage, did the reverse with the uh, the bar area. Uh, it was a huge endeavor. It certainly was. Judy, what is your approach uh, to references and research when you start a design project? And at which point do you bring your decorator in? 
I love doing research. That's my favorite part. Um, on this show, we didn't have so much time. I mean, I did tons of research in the beginning when I did have sufficient prep, but after one and nine, which we shot back to back, we were, it was a mad dash sprint for nine months. Mm -hmm. So, um, Kathy, thankfully, was game to sort of start very from the very beginning, and we had a nice shorthand. And I think because we both had done commercials, we were able to do this sort of and not sort of get overwhelmed, but do it in a way that we understood where we could do the shortcuts and what needed more work and what needed more detail and not. So um, I brought Kathy on very early. We, you know, there were some research that we shared. And then she also did her own research that we would sit and discuss literally passing in the hallway on my way to scouting six more locations. What do you think of this? That looks great. I like that. Great. I'll see you later today. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. I mean, it was really like that for every episode. And yeah. um, Kathy never sort of wavered and she stayed calm and just did the work. And I, I, we worked really well together. I loved her professionalism and her ability to stay calm and then deliver, magically deliver every 10 days. <laughs> yeah. Suddenly it happens and you don't even know it. <laughs> Kathy, um, you've done a lot of work. Are you normally brought in early? At what point in production do you feel most comfortable coming into work? Do you want the main locations to already be scouted, for instance? Well, it helps. Um, I, I like to get a sense of what the direction is based on some of the locations that they've already chosen. Or um, I, it seems like more and more I come in with three or five weeks uh, prep. When All right. It's you know you prefer to get like eight weeks at least, but um, uh, that doesn't always happen. So I've you know I have an internal shorthand of cutting to the chase. I know what the priorities are to start sourcing right away. Uh, the, the things that take more time to find. So I, I start on that first. I deal with priorities and um, and then it kind of comes together. Uh, it's always a scramble, but <laughs> always <laughs> we stay ahead of it. Now, you touched on this earlier, and my observation from watching the, the episodes was that it it's not quite a road picture. But it's very close to a road picture. And there's a lot of different uh, locations and parts of the country and that kind of thing. You said that you built them all in Newburgh. That was our hub, um, except for the exteriors for episode one. All the casino exteriors were done in Laughlin, Nevada. And then episode two, that was shot entirely on location outside of Albuquerque. But um, other than that, yeah, it was all in the Hudson Valley. And um, thank God that we had a great locations department as well. They kept turning yes. up. Uh, miracles left and right. And back to your previous question, I brought Kathy on early for episode eight for LAM as well as Arthur's Barn. So she could get a sense of the space, which I knew was going to be a huge set deck mm -hmm. um, <laughs> endeavor. So yeah, I mean, I try to bring her on or bring any decorator on as early as possible, because I think it helps the process and other than photos to just actually be in the space. It was a big help also when we started on the uh, the barbecue, the Texas barbecue boils, because that was supposed to be a Texas location um, roadhouse out in the middle of nowhere, somewhere between Arizona and Dallas or whatever. And we did create that in Newburgh, New York. Um, <laughs> it was a field, a farmer's field. And uh, we literally, there was an existing, I guess, kind of a roadhouse bar that the, mm -hmm. the community used. There was a parking lot in the front of it. And it had been a, I think the guy, the owner's father had owned it as in the forties as a gas station. So this building was a gas station. We transformed the property into this Texas roadhouse with outdoor, indoor spaces, the indoor kitchen, the meat lockers, the, the outdoor barbecue area, the pit area. We had lots of reference of Texas barbecue pits and so I had to bring in like 3,000 gallon uh, barbecue smokers on trailers. And we built this uh, duty design, this wonderful outdoor barbecue shed where the smokers were all under the shed. We paved the parking lot. We dug in 12 uh, 
electric poles to string the lighting all around the, the space. Uh, we built, brought in the tents, um, sewed all the fabric for the tents, created this whole environment of this Texas outdoor roadhouse uh, barbecue place that did not exist there. Tell you, as a native Texan, I think you did a great job. <laughs> I grew up going to places like that. That one's a little larger than the ones I remember. But, yep. um, yeah, they had three smokers in that one and uh, they worked. We had three types of wood per the script. Who was your barbecue advisor? You must have had well, an, that uh, Wrangler. I lucked out because when I started the early research uh, that Judy had brought me in a little bit early, uh, I was looking at buying these units, trying to rent them, these smokers. And then I found a guy, a local guy who was a barbecue expert who had his own smoker. He had actually a couple of them. And I rented one or two from him, some of the smaller smoke smokers. And then I found uh, a couple of other sources and brought in the other two large smokers. So wow. we kind of looked out with that, built the environment around them. We graveled the, the floor. We built a... Um, yeah, we improved the, the location quite a bit by building out cement pads and slabs and places and then brought in these tents. And uh, Kathy, you were based in Newburgh, right? Did you yes. ever do any of the work out west? I did not. Because a lot of our viewers are people who would like to be in the business at some point, I think. Uh, and people who are interested in the business. How did you relate to your associate out west did you have input or did she have input with you well most of that was through judy i think uh we didn't do everything we created except for the exteriors which were were, were they second unit for vegas or yeah for vegas Florida. there i think there was a local decorator but because each episode was its own um own like mini movie Mm -hmm. uh, there were no Amort sets. And so we could not, we didn't have a, a stage set that we kept going back to, you know, for part of the shoot. We had to create every set for each episode. Yeah, so you were already on day one, basically, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, and we had two decorators. Um, uh, Elizabeth uh, um, Eggert was a second decorator, and we each had our own episode. Uh, she had odds, I had evens, and then the other episode was... Um, uh, mostly exteriors, and I think you had a, a maybe a local decorator or somebody out there, Judy. Yeah, Dana Jensen. Yeah, she did the exteriors for Nevada and all of uh, New Mexico because you know so much of what we were prepping and shooting would overlap, so there was no way we could do it with one decorator. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know that's not ideal for most decorators to do that, but there was really no other way to do the show. Uh, how, was your, how was your relationships with your various set decorators that you had to communicate to and had to communicate to you? Were you, uh, Kathy was the overall production decorator, essentially. So did you uh, have Kathy meet with the other decorators or were you the sole go-between? I was the sole uh person who was sort of giving the direction for each episode, but Kathy and the other decorators obviously spoke when there were interiors and exteriors that had to overlap. So I know Lizzie yeah. spoke to Day a lot about, you know, Charlie's interior trailer, which we shot in Newburgh versus trucking it out there and what, what the continuity had to look like when they opened the door, because we then we had to truck all the set dressing out there as well. Yeah, I think all the decorators spoke, but, you know, everyone was so busy with their three or four episodes that, you know, everyone was prepping simultaneously. There was no way to do one at a time, especially something like Arthur's Barn. I know Kathy started on that day one when she started. <laughs> Let's talk about the Orpheus Syndrome for a minute. That's your episode eight. I'll tell you, that was astonishing. And I was so impressed, uh, Kathy, by all the sculpture and the maquettes and so on that occupied the barn who did that <laughs> where did those <laughs> where did those pieces come from well there were so many sources um that we had to draw from and uh, uh, the original concept i think came from natasha and ryan where they admired the work of phil tippett who was the um master creator creature creator on star wars and jurassic park and he had you know kind of 
personally revitalized uh, stop motion animation. And so they had him create these creatures that Nick Nolte is supposed to be working with in his Orpheus Syndrome movie, you know, kind of flashback of uh, the death sequence that he felt responsible for in the early days of their business. So those were the jumping off points um, creatively. And then we had to fill the space with examples of what his work may have been like the past 40 years. And um, basically I pulled from a lot of different sources. Our scenic team got really excited and started making creatures as well. They made the, <laughs> the gigantic um, uh, skeleton dinosaur that we hung from the ceiling and all these other creatures. There's There was a place called Costume Armorer in New, near Newburgh who had yeah. their own creatures that they had sent used for Disney. So I had to selectively pick the ones that looked, um, you know, kind of scary. Uh, we had pulled from sources out in LA um, who made creatures. There was no one vendor who had everything we needed. So I just got all these bits and elements from so many different uh, sources. Dapper Cadaver uh, did a couple of things. Uh, we had independent artists. Uh, Pro Renfex is another uh, vendor who's like a uh, special effects master of doing masks and images. Uh, we just pulled together whatever we could that seemed to fit. Yeah, that's that's my design board for some of the elements. And it was fun. It was and, and an interesting thing, too, was because it was a flashback sequence and and Arthur was working on a flatbed moviola um, or a Stein, Steinbeck. And um, he also had a, an upright moviola in the background. And a lot of my buyers are young and they don't know they've never worked with those things before. So right. nobody really understood the difference between. 16 millimeter and 35 i'd say well give me cans of 16 millimeter film and and i need some 35 millimeter mags and all kinds of stuff and they were like is that the the width of the can and i said no it's the thickness of the film is that and i had to give them lessons on how you know what 16 millimeter size was and what 35 millimeter film looked like and how that affected the size of the canister and what would yeah. fit on the correct uh, steam back. So that was interesting. Yes, that is why they hire you, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Are these the panels that you created to show the director? Well, yes. I mean, I, I when I start sourcing stuff, I mentally put the set together on my collage boards, basically. And I like to show, I'll show these to Judy and say, okay, this is the direction I'm going in. This is what I'm thinking of. Uh, often I'll show these elements also, the furniture or whatever, to the concept artist. And then they do a lot of those concept drawings have pieces in them that I've already sourced. This archive looked absolutely great. And I totally believed it. Judy, did you do the initial research on this or was that part of Kathy's responsibility? Well, I, we both did research um, independently. You know, early on, I had pulled some references of, you know, Phil Tippett's work and mm -hmm. also of other artists. And as Kathy was saying, we all, it was kind of all hands on deck to try to find as many different vendors to give us the quality and the quantity we needed to fill that barn. So we kind of started wide and then sort of narrowed down like, okay, this sort of works and this would all work really well together for a variety of expressing his 30 plus years. Um, so yeah, we both did research. It was slightly different, but obviously a lot of overlap. And then, yeah, this was a beautiful room, except it was a little daunting because it was completely empty. The empty space and we fill it up. Right. There was a lot of stuff. This was built up in Newburgh. This was part of um, the I Am Pay building that was uh, used to be an IBM headquarters. It was like an abandoned little complex. So we kept finding all these different spaces that we could turn into different things. So this was probably the records office um, and all the shelves were there, thank God. And yeah. we moved a few around and, you know, discuss with the DP, like, how can we limit this? We can't obviously fill the entire room. Uh, it was easily 5,000 square feet. Um, so I think we had a little assistance from visual effects, but maybe not. I think they limited the scope and yeah, it worked out really well. I wanted to bring in as much volume of stuff as we could rather than depend on CGI. 
right. but uh, the the space itself, the building with the glass pyramid, and as the uh, location was fabulous, and and Judy's design, I think, for the the gala um, and the way the space was lit by Jaron, uh, it was just gorgeous. Yes, the uh, the space was huge, and we wanted to create this flashback of the 40 years of uh, of the, the business that these three people had created to cr make these creatures. And uh, it was a great opportunity to pull all those elements together for the ending, the dramatic murder ending. <laughs> yeah, really. And I had just have to say, it was such a pleasure to see Cherry Jones. Uh, I love her. And she got to look glamorous. Yeah. She doesn't That's usually amazing. get to do. Yeah, that was marvelous. So tell me a little bit about LAM. You obviously had the whole process of designing the logo and the fixtures and doing all of that stuff. Kathy, what were you able to bring in? The space was totally empty. Um, so we brought in sculptures. We brought in, um, we had Mike Syme of Visual Alchemy bring in the uh, huge uh, projection screens and monitors. Um, we created, well, Judy designed, there wasn't a real room for Arthur's um, exhibit of his work specifically, because it was the space itself was supposed to be an exhibit of the, the company LAM since their inception and some of the projects that they created together uh, before Arthur left the business. And then his, his room was actually built out of, um, from this uh, space, the IBM building, and that the way Judy merged those together uh, kind of seamlessly made them made it feel like uh, an extension of the original IMP space. And that was the, where we had all the creatures. I thought that was a marvelous uh, exhibit space. Yeah, it was well presented and it all. Yeah. So we it. brought everything right. in for that all the display cases, the lighting, yeah. the, the trusses, the the creatures. Uh, it was hard to get great pictures of it because we were moving so quickly, right, Judy? Yeah. They were, um, yeah, we were literally dressing as they were arriving, I think, yeah. as we were yeah. for every episode. Yeah. yeah. I believe that it happens a lot. Um, <laughs> Kathy, let me ask you this. At what point do you give up fi on finding something and just say, listen, we're going to build all of these things? Mm -hmm. Like the lighted pedestals, for instance. I mean, mm -hmm. every set decorator has had to do a set with lighted pedestals at some point. Yeah. Were you able to find any or rent any, or did you just build I, it? I, we built some because it's some of the bigger ones, but then I was able to rent them and, and or have them custom made um, before we had to shoot this last part. So right. I lucked out because I think we ended up with about 20 of them. And... Uh, Wow. Uh, we did we did have them custom made or some sizes were existing stock for this one company, uh, but it was just getting them and getting everything in a timely way. Right. You know, it's so exciting to see a decorator and a designer who work so closely together and are so in sync. And that's a pleasure. And you can tell when you're watching it that there is a cohesiveness to the sets and the locations. I, I didn't once feel that this was done by somebody else. You know, it was two different things. I think that it all worked together uh, very well. Thank you. You did a great job. Thank you. That's, that's a compliment coming from you, Leslie. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Every episode was so complete uh, and so highly detailed. That's what just, even the gas stations. I mean, everything, the convenience stores and all that, and obviously you had Subway sandwiches on board, <laughs> which is <laughs> sort of amazing, but nobody dies from eating a sandwich. So I guess it was all right. Uh, was there other product placement that you did, Kathy, that you could arrange? There was a good bit of product placement. Uh, we, we did get a lot of the filler for this gas station interior. We were sent uh, products to, to put in some automotive stuff. And then we were able to, it was an existing gas station or it wasn't a gas station, it was an auto repair building. And we brought in the um, gas tanks and built the, the little island for the gas tanks. I'd use those on another, on a different show, something similar. All the exterior stuff we added, the neon, um, you know, we had a, a good basic space. 
Um, right. And we got we got some good product placement for a lot, a lot of the beverages, alcohol in the theater uh, sets and uh, some of the stuff here. Uh, this was a, a different, this was the barbecue gas station that we converted into the barbecue uh, roadhouse boils kitchen and uh, meat locker. So all of this is brought in. All, none of this was there. I think mm -hmm. actually so the stainless steel um, beer thing in the in the back uh, was existing. So we just incorporated that into the kitchen. This is a topic that people not in the business find boring, but I just have to ask, how was your budget? At which point did you say, wait a minute, this can't be done for this money? Uh, or did you say, we'll always do it. We'll figure out a way to make it work for the money you have. Having come from commercials and starting in retail commercials where you have to, uh, and then I was doing a lot of 1-800 commercials, you have to make sure that what you're bringing uh, reads well on the set. And sometimes you can, you can do well with something that's not full blown expensive. So Judy and I both kind of have a sense for what works and what doesn't. Um, we had a, a, a good budget on this show, uh, but my philosophy is to try and save money everywhere I can, as long as it ends up on screen. And um, and then I have money for what really matters when I have to you know, spend a lot of money on creatures or whatever. So it's a juggling game, but that's this that's with any job. And uh, you, you had said earlier that you um, can tell what the priorities are when you read a script or when you look mm -hmm. at I assume you read several scripts, hopefully at a time you, had, you, you knew what was coming up. Right. Um, how do you decide? what is your priority what's the priority for the project what's judy's priority what's natasha's priority and then how do you make all those things work together you talk to one another you communicate it's a collaborative kind of thing if something is being requested that we don't feel like we have the time to make happen you have to say it right up front this i see this is a potential issue and and I think the ability to recognize those situations comes from experience and having been there, done that before and and saying, OK, uh, we can't do that, but we can do this. And so you prioritize and you focus on what's doable and what tells the story in the most efficient and, and beautiful way. I mean, it should look good. So right. We're, um, let, let's talk about the hook for a moment. We can. I want to know about your yacht that you built and have you sailed in it yet? Is that how you got to Portugal? I was so tempted to take that set home and put it in my basement as a as an Airbnb kind of opportunity. Because oh, it, I love it. It was so phenomenal. Um, and the design, you know, it. we had a real yacht that we shot the exteriors up on the Hudson River. Uh, and the inside was similar to this, but uh, not exactly. We made it a little bit bigger, but the scenic department did an amazing job with the, the you know, the wood feeling. Uh, we upholstered the ceilings, the, you know, all the furniture, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. we, we sourced, you know, nautical um, windows and toilets and supplies wherever possible, the hardware, you know, it was a it was a challenge to bring it in, but I thought the execution was pretty incredible. I thought it was a boat. <laughs> I, mean, I gotta tell you, I hated when it got torn down yeah. because very yeah. sad. Yeah. Yeah. Judy, how did you do the research for this? What were your mar marching orders from the director? Well, we knew there was going to be a fight scene, so I had to accommodate that. And Charlie had a sort of, she needed an escape hatch, literally. So we knew those two things had to be part of the design. But also we couldn't deviate too much from the exterior. I mean, we obviously cheated the size and it's, you know, we're pushing it here. The width is much wider than the exterior boat when you see them come up on it. But, um, you know, we just looked at similar models of that particular boat that we were shooting for the exterior and just had a look around of research of okay what's going to be interesting what sharp elements do we want to eliminate because we knew that they were going to go at it so you know we rounded some edges and i think it worked i would have liked to have seen more of the fight in there it was very quick i thought it was very quick yes yeah 
but that did dictate some of the surfaces and having a, um, a cushioned chair there instead of a coffee table. Uh, mm -hmm. So a cushioned chair with a tray on it. Um, things that, that would work for the fight scene. Yeah, well, it, it, uh, I thought it was very successful. I've been on big boats and that's what they look like. You know, but as you say, they're a smaller, a little more cramped interior. Well, it was helpful. I've been on a lot of boats too. And it, I, I went into the, uh, when I came to see what the dressers were doing one day and I saw the toilet was so low on the floor, I went, nope, you got to build a box under it, raise it up, that no six foot man would be on a toilet that low. <laughs> so yeah. little, little things like that. Finding the sliding door for him to come in was a real, it's a real door that matched the location, the actual yacht and that was very hard to find did you go to the manufacturer we did yeah. yeah yeah but finding the getting it in the right direction and getting one that was a little bit translucent so that the the dp wanted light to show through so there are all these little challenges well i think it worked now we we did talk briefly uh about the whole barbecue set there was a radio station there that i believe you built right Yep. Yes. And that across the across the pit. How was the size determined, I guess, is my question. How did you know what kind of radio station it was? Ryan wanted it to feel like, you know, very small, very makeshift in a way and, you know, kind of no windows. And I said, well, it should have a window or two. I mean, other than the one he climbs out of. So I showed him some references and he picked something that was more like a bunker. And, um, you know, we embellished it a little bit. So it's not just a square box <laughs> that he climbs out of. Um, and then we built the set on stage. So he wanted it to feel small. He wanted it to feel makeshift and, you know, obviously big enough to still shoot. And so all the walls did fly out. And I think in the end, they only ended up pulling one. But, um, yeah, this was a very fun collaboration as well, uh, you know, Kathy is a joy to work with because she comes to the table with ideas and is very, um, very prepared in a way that makes my life so much easier than, you know, trying to find all the research, trying to do all the work and say, this is what we're doing, as opposed to her coming to the table with her own research. And then it becomes a dialogue and a discussion, which is always welcome for me, you know, but That's this great. is a fun set. Yeah. A good collaboration. Um, are there any other sets or moments that you'd like to talk about uh, with us that you feel would be important? <laughs> oh, okay. Boyle's office. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. That was a set on the stage that we had up in Newburgh. Great color choices there, Judy. We had to make this feel like it was a continuation off the kitchen. So we, you know, duplicated the door in two different places and then obviously cheated the size and then brought in the windows that exist on the side of the building to kind of tie it in. Yeah, this was also on stage next to the radio station. But I wanted to bring up the carpet for the theater for a moment, back to our original point that Kathy was talking about. The dinner theater. The dinner theater, yeah. The um, This idea of the budget and what's important and what are the priorities, you know, because we had so little time, we knew that, yes, we were going to see the floor, but probably not the focal point because it was going to be lit dark. But I didn't want solid. And um, I know that Kathy searched high and low for the square footage. So A, it was an availability and B, it was a cost. So, you know, we we talked about it. We can get this amount, but then the other half will be the original. So maybe we get something that's slightly different and we paint it all together. So. It's about troubleshooting and understanding, once again, what the priorities are and what you're going to see and not maybe see so much in the dark. So those are always things that you're trying to weigh because you rarely have time to get everything and you rarely have time to buy everything. But it worked out really well. Yeah, we, the Scenics, rolled paint onto that and we did a few tests to get the color right. But yeah, I, I think they worked. sprayed um, right dye or something. Yeah. They did a had some sprayer over all the carpet. And then there was a dance floor in the middle that right. we didn't have the same carpet. So we did a complimentary mat and carpet that kind of worked mm. with what we had painted. Kathy, I, I want to ask you this question. You are a vice president 
of the Set Decorators Society. Is that right? Yes, the New and York. The New York uh, chapters. chapters, right. And I'm wondering, what does that mean for you? What is the fellowship of set decorators uh, mean for you? Well, um, I think I was drawn to it because, and it's a, it's a, it's always a, a time factor because in New York, you know, we're so busy decorators running around that we we didn't have a lot of time to feel that connection to the West Coast where the main office is. Uh, their meetings are three hours, you know, uh, later than than our time frame, earlier than our time frame. And um, so it's nice to have a community among the set decorators uh, to share information and resources. I think in the old days, decorators were very protective of their, their vendors and they kind of did not communicate with each other. And I appreciate the, the educational reach out part of being a decorator to younger people coming into the business um, and the vast experience that I've gotten over the past, I'm not even gonna say how many years of, of so many varied aspects of this business, but it's fun teaching that and imparting it. And it's great to feel that connection with the, the West Coast people. Um, uh, and, and now, you know, we've expanded the website, we're doing all this great stuff. And I think people are, uh, the decorators are feeling more involved and, and connected to each other. There's a Atlanta uh, division now, there's a Canadian division. So we're all um, communicating and sharing information and, and have board That's meetings. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. I started in the business in the old days, as you said, yes. and you're absolutely right. There was an isolation. Uh, I didn't know any other set decorators. I didn't know how they did it or how the job was supposed to be done. I thought I invented it <laughs> when I first started. Right. Uh, but then when the set, when the SDSA was created, there was a, it was like, oh, wow, look at all these people. I, I started out in LA and, and then moved back to New York, but it was a, it was quite exciting, you know. Anyway, I just want to say thank you to both of you. Uh, Judy Ree, uh, your work is marvelous. Uh, I would say keep going, don't stop. And Kathy, the same to you. I really appreciate you being here and, and uh, seeing your beautiful work. Thank okay. you, Leslie. We wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. All right, this is Leslie Rollins with the Set Decorator Society saying goodbye and thank you for watching this edition of Inside the Set with Set Decor. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Inside the Set with Set Decor. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, setdecor.com.